this is our snow makeup Sunday. Um, what I mean by that, if you remember earlier in the winter, we had some of that dreadful white stuff fall on our roads, and it caused us to cancel church, which um, meant that we had to figure out how to reshuffle a, a, a sermon series, because that's one of the disadvantages when you lay out all your sermon series at the beginning of the year, and then God decides to chuckle at your plan and dumps white stuff on the roads. You have to figure out how you're going to make up the, the sermon because you don't want to end the series at the wrong place. So what we decided to do was this was actually supposed to be the week the cantata was supposed to be sung. So we moved the cantata to Easter, and then we're going to finish up this just walk across the room. So this is going to be an untraditional Palm Sunday sermon, but that's okay. Um, we've arrived at the final week of this little series that we started four weeks ago about the idea of outreach. And just so you know, this hasn't been a very super spiritual kind of study because this isn't about being super spiritual. This is about us reaching out to people that need to hear our story. They need to hear our story, well, because we're part of God's story. So we started taking this walk, and, and in week one, we looked at moving ourselves from our comfort zone to the zone of the unknown. Moving ourselves from that place where we're just kind of living our life in comfort and moving ourselves out to where we can actually interface with the people. Because that's the main ingredient that we need to, to make Christians is you have to have people. You have to have somebody that is willing to listen to your story. And we talked, to, we talked about living our life in 3D. That means living our life in such a way that we begin to develop friendships, living our life in such a way that we discover people's stories, living our life in such a way that we discern next steps as God leads us into talking and working with people. In week three, we got a little scary thought because we found out eventually we have to start talking. We have to be willing to, to tell people our story. And the good news is, is I think what I, we learned is that we're not talking about telling our story by quoting people a bunch of scripture, by telling people what, what's wrong with their life. I'm talking about telling our story so that people can see, you know what, I'm as damaged as you are. I, I've got as many broken parts in my life as you have in your past. You need to they need to hear our story because our stories make us real, and then that makes, in turn, makes God real. So that's the three things that we've looked at so far, and this week we're going to close up by looking at a grander vision of living. Now, we hear that word vision in our church, and if you've been here for a while, hopefully immediately this picture pops in your head. Um, this is our church's vision about how we go about reaching the world. We begin in our community, and we simply try to move people from our community into our crowd. That's as simple as saying, would you like to come to church with me? That's as simple as saying, would you like to come and watch a movie with us as we do Cinco de Mayo party? That's as simple as inviting them to an event that is just moving people from the shores of our community, the people that we know, into the crowd. Once they're in the crowd, we begin to teach them, and we hope them to help them make a connection with who Jesus is. And after they make a connection with who Jesus is, let them realize on their own, through hearing our stories and hearing our church's story, that they have to have a relationship with Christ. That's our vision. We took it from a verse. Do you remember where I took it from? I'll give you a hint in just a few moments. I've been trying to point people to faith for pretty much my whole adult life. And when someone says the door is closed and I'm never going to open it, I never take never as an answer. I, I go, never just means no for now. And people quite often are just one devastation away, one business reversal away, one relational disaster away from having their apple cart so upset that they would consider God afresh. And what I dream of for Christ followers everywhere is that they go to work, they go in the neighborhood, they go to school, they go to the club, wherever they go, that instead of being annoyed by people or put off by people who believe differently and have different lifestyles, just imagine, imagine what their life would be like if God were at the center. And let that inspire you to pray toward that. The author of the book, 
just to walk across the room, Bill Hybels, wants to inspire us. He wants to inspire us to take a different look at how we view people. That little image that I just shared you, the community to the crowd, the crowd to the connected, the connected to the committed, that all came from a a verse in Scripture, a chapter in Scripture, Luke chapter 5. If you have your copy of God's Word this morning, or if you don't, there's one in the pew rack in front of you. Let me encourage you to make your way to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And this is what the story reads. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gesserit, the people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they they signaled their partners in other boats to come out and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and his his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so, so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you are going to fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore and they left everything and followed him. We have taken this particular Bible verse, this story, and we focused it on our church vision. We focused it on somebody trying to establish a relationship with Christ. That's where that picture came from that I showed you. But this morning, I want to refocus it. I want to refocus it not on somebody that is just trying to figure out what it means to have a relationship with Christ. I want to focus it on Peter. Peter is an example as a person Jesus is trying to get to go out and share the story, to go out and tell people. You see, Jesus is trying to change Peter's focus. Because I want to tell you something, when this story begins, Peter's focus isn't on the people. As a matter of fact, Peter's focus goes through five distinct steps as he begins to change what he's doing. And focus number one, what is Peter focused on? Well, Peter's focused on work. He is. He's there at the shore washing his nets. He isn't there to hear Jesus. He isn't there to be concerned about people. He's only there because it's his job. He's being paid to be there. Now, I want to make sure you understand something. Work is not a bad thing. I'm not telling us that we should not have jobs. I'm not telling us that we should not work. Most of you know I am a bivocational pastor. I have another job away from here that I do Monday through Friday. And in 2 Thessalonians, it tells us, verse th- chapter 3, verse 10, For even when you were willing, for even when we were with you, you gave, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. There is this idea that work is important. We should work. We should be busy doing something. But you understand, it cannot be our focus because guess what? Work is temporary. I am 48 years old. And at 48 years old, so far, I have been a grass cutter, a blue jean folder, a laundromat worker, a customer service representative, a telemarketer selling carpet cleaning, a warehouse worker, a cable installer, a systems operator, a a software engineer, and you get the idea. I have gone through a lot of jobs in my life because work is temporary. That thing that I'm doing, if it becomes the obsession of my life, you understand, I could go in tomorrow and work could change once again because they could decide to go in a different direction. My work, it is temporary. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11 says, Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless and the chasing after the wind. Nothing was was gained under the sun. You understand, work is what it is. It is how I support my life, but it can't become my life. That can't be my focus if I am going to have the same focus that Jesus wants me to have for people. So we had to change Peter's focus. And so Jesus asked to use the boat. And I want to tell you something. 
immediately Peter's focus changed. Because you know what? That boat was Peter's possession. And not only was it Peter's possession, that boat was important to who Peter was. Because that boat, it was his livelihood. I mean, if that boat got sank, there was no more fish. And if there were no more fish, then that means there was no more money for fishing. And if there was no more money for fishing, then how am I going to make all of my bills? That, that request of Jesus to use that boat was so important to Peter. And I tried to think of something that would be equated to that in my life. The only thing I could think of was my car. My, my car had some mechanical problems a couple of weeks ago, and I had to put it in the shop. And it was only there for a day, but I want to tell you something. I noticed it missing. Without my car, I can't get back and forth to work. Without my car, we can't get kids where they need to be for their activities and their events. Without my car, I could not imagine. Could you imagine if Jesus came to me and said, could I borrow your car for a day? I'd have to say, well, you know, Jesus, I got this stuff going on in my life. I got this schedule I got to keep. Really? You understand that that boat was everything that for Peter, and that car means a lot to me, but my possessions, they're temporary. They aren't going to be here forever. I mean, if you want to talk about how many jobs I've had, you don't even want to know about how many cars I've owned in my life. I mean, my mom and dad swore at one time I changed cars like most people change socks. I mean, you just it's temporary. They're just things. Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermins do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. God wants us to change our focus, but we can't go from just focused on our work to focused on what I have, my possessions. Because you know what? All of those things are temporary. The cars will break down. The houses always need maintenance. The grass has to be cut. Even the church building, this is all temporary. This isn't made to be forever. So our focus has to change. And we go from focused on our work to focus on our possessions to our focus three, we begin to focus on our situations. As Peter focused from the shore, as Peter rode from the shore, as he moved from the shore, he focused on the situation because there were things to do. There was rowing to do. There was watching the waves and the currents. There was the lowering of the nets. All of these things had to be done. They had to be accomplished. And one of them, he was even doing exactly what Jesus asked him to do, row the boat and put down the nets. So it isn't like he just made up the situation. But you need to understand that, well, all of these activities, they took his attention. He couldn't focus on who God was. The situation was constantly changing. As the winds changed and as he went from place to place, as he moved out from the shore, things just weren't what they were supposed to be. And You have to realize that when I focus on my situation, life is a series of ebbs and flows. That thing that is so important, that is so critical to me, that situation that just has me so tied up right now, you understand in a few years it's not going to be that important to me. My situation changes constantly. I remember when I was in high school. I still do remember my high school, by the way. And you know what the, the things people are focused on in high school? My sister labels them the fumes, perfumes and car fumes. That was the focus, but you know what? That isn't our focus anymore. My life has changed, and when my kids were really little, I mean, there were times that I worried whether or not they were breathing at night. You know, when you first bring them home, you have them close to the bed, and you reach over every now and you touch them to make sure you're still feeling breathing. That, that, we went through that situation. Now I just wonder if they'll just go to bed on time because I'm not so much concerned. My situation has changed, and we need to realize situations are temporary. If I allow my situation to consume my life, then you know what? My life isn't going to go very well because it's always changing. So he had another focus as he moved away from the situation. They caught all of these fish. And this next thing that he's focused about is all about the fish. Man, they brought in those nets, and they were full of fish, and they were, the nets were breaking, and they had to call in another boat. And I know what he's thinking. I know exactly what Peter's thinking. He's thinking, maybe I can take a few days off from work. This catch could just mean I can take it easy. After all, I just worked a double shift. 
I worked all night, and I, I just worked all day, and now i got to clean these fish, and when I'm all done, I'm going to take a vacation. I'm going to Disney World. Maybe that's what he's thinking. Maybe he's thinking, he's looking at, he's counting the fish in dollars. Well, there's one fish, two fish, three fish. Man, think of all the money I've got. I can now afford to go out and buy myself that new boat that I wanted. I can go out and afford to buy the bigger house down the street. I can take the fish and turn it into cold, hard cash, and I can do something with it. And that is what Peter's probably thinking, because it says they were astonished at all of the fish. They were just eyeing the fish. You notice who they weren't watching? Jesus was still standing there. They were focused on the fish. All those fish, they flopped around, and they got so excited, but you have to understand something. It's temporary. Those fish... They drug them from the water. Now, I don't know much about fishing. I don't like to fish myself. But I do understand biology. If you drag a fish from water and you leave him laying on the, on the ground, guess what? The fish is going to die. And then if you consume the fish and you decide to eat the fish, then guess what? The fish is gone. The fish is temporary. Eventually, you have to go fishing again because it's all temporary. Everything about the situation, everything about the fish, it's all going to change in just a matter of time. So there's another focus, though. You see, Peter began to look at those fish as they flopped around on the shore. And, well, he began to focus on himself. Peter began to evaluate what had happened, and Peter got a glimpse of God. Just a peek. He began to look at this fish, and he'd been a fisherman for many years. He said, this ain't normal. This is not how fishing works. I don't usually pull in. Something's wrong with this picture. And, well, he came to a conclusion. See, as he focused on himself, he, um, he said, I'm not worthy. You see, for the first time in Peter's life, he looked at Jesus, and he realized who Jesus was, and he says, I know who you are, and I know who I am, and I'm not worthy to be in your presence. And so he told Jesus what many people tell Jesus. Get away. I got sin in my life, Jesus. You you got to get away from me because I can't be around you. you. You have to get away because I have things that are wrong in my life. I have things that are busted and broken and that I just can't be in your presence. Jesus, I can't be here right now. Get away. In the video clip that we watched, that's exactly what Bill Hybels is talking about. See, when people begin to hear our stories and people begin to understand who God is, their natural reaction is no. Get away. Get some distance between me and you because I'm not worthy for what you're talking about. You don't understand what I've done in my past. You don't understand what my past looks like. You don't understand the hurt that I've caused or the sin that I'm involved. Well, you don't understand any of that. And you know what? Jesus says, your sin, in my eyes, it's temporary. It's temporary. You see, because Jesus came with a plan for sin. Next week, we're going to celebrate Easter, the risen Savior, and that was the culmination of the plan, that Jesus came with a plan to solve the sin issue. But the thing is, is that's the story. That is, each and every one of our stories, if you've come to a relationship in Christ, you understand it's temporary. Everything in my life is temporary except for the thing that Jesus wanted us to focus on. See, Jesus had to take Peter through all of these steps because he needed Peter to see your work is temporary. Your possessions are temporary. Your situation is temporary. Your accomplishments, the fish, they're temporary. Even your sin, it can be temporary. But I want you to focus on the one thing that I want you to focus on. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Jesus was interested in the only thing that's permanent on earth. You see, everything changes. Cars go to the junkyard, careers change, people move, everything adjusts. But you know what? People are permanent. People are eternal. People have a this life and an afterlife. 
this suit that I wear today, the earth suit, is, well, it's, it's me, but inside of me is another part of me that, that is going to live forever. Given enough time, this body will break down. I'm finding it out more and more every day. I go out and do something, and you know what? I did things when I was like a teenager, and I'd get up the next day, and I'd be fine. I do the same thing now at 48 years old, and I'm getting on my, what was I thinking? Because my body begins to break down, but you understand, I am still eternal, and the question becomes is where do I spend that part of my life? Because people are eternal. And that's where our story takes shape. You see, Jesus desires that we invest in the only thing that will last forever, and that is people. Jesus desires that we tell our story to others, that we walk across the room and share our life with their lives, not because we think we've got all the answers, because I don't even have all the questions at this point. He wants us to share our story because we have an answer for that hole that's inside of every single person. That sense that people are missing something, we know what they're missing because we have found it. And it's our responsibility to change our focus. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 reads this way. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen. We fix our eyes not on the things that are right here in front of me that I focus on so often, those temporary things, but what is unseen? Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. See, I think sometimes we get it upside down, or inside out, or whichever way you want to put it. We focus our life on the here and now, and then at the end, we try to figure out where did all the time go. God wants us to take our eyes off of the here and now, off of the scene, off of my situation in my life, and focus on the people that are all around us. People that are all around us that are in search of something better for their life. People who are currently focused on their temporary. God wants us to help them see their eternal. See, that's what this idea of just walk across the room is about. I'm not coming into your life. I'm not walking across the room because you need to have something fixed. I'm coming into your life because I'm here to share something that may help you in your life. I want you to begin to think about this. Is each and every one of us this year committed to take that one single walk into one person's life and tell our story? That means within this year we will impact 50 lives. And let's just say that we were only successful 10% of the time and five people decided to follow Christ from listening to the story. Well, then next year, guess what? We're going to be able to tell 55 people. And that means we'll have more crop. And then the next year, we can go and tell another set of people. And we can just keep moving and moving and moving. But here's the deal. You have to take the first walk. You have to decide for yourself, you know what? People are more important than what I'm doing. People are more important than where I work. People are more important than the house or the boat or the car or whatever the possession of your delight is. Because people are eternal. We're going to do a time of decision, and I want you to ponder this thought. Maybe you're here today, and you have never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You know what? Have I got a story for you? Come on forward during our time of decision. We'll put you with somebody. We will turn the pages and we will show you what the story of Christ is and we'll show you how it impacted our lives. You're welcome to do that. That's what we're here to do, is to share that story. If you're here this morning, though, and you've accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, but you, you're just kind of floundering, you're just kind of sitting there, let me tell you the solution. Change your focus. Get your eyes on the things that Jesus wants you to look at. Understand, this is all about people. It's not about a building. It's not about music. It's not about anything except for what Jesus was interested in. People. Would you please stand? We're going to sing, and then we're going to pray.